Hi everybody and thank you for joining me on this presentation about finding a foundation for your open source project. Let's start with a little context. First of all, why this topic? Well, it turns out that I've been focusing on governance questions and open source foundations in my consulting practice a lot over the course of the last two years. I've been consulting for the AMP project to, being, to bring it to the OpenJS Foundation. I've advised the Coil company on setting up its Interledger Foundation. I've done pro bono analysis work to see if it made sense to set uh, W3C's headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. I'm currently working also pro bono on creating another software foundation in Geneva. Um, and I've been sitting on the, the OpenJS Projects Advisory Council and the OpenJS Foundation Cross Project Council. So with this sort of background, let's uh, get started. The first question that comes up to mind is, well, what is a foundation and what is it, what is it for? And it turns out that a foundation essentially provides a um, legal entity for open source projects, right? And it can do a lot of things that a project by itself is not legally entitled to do. It can receive and spend money. So this is great for, for example, travel expenses, infrastructure costs, etc. It can acquire its own assets, which is important to hold trademarks. Um, it can grant and receive licenses, which is great for copywriting and patents. It can hire people for, for example, for coaching or for security audit. It can host events, et cetera, et cetera, right? So essentially a foundation is there to give to an open source project the kind of legal structure that em empowers it to do um, the kind of things that normally either a person or a corporation are able to do. And, you know, if your instinctive reaction to uh, this description of what a foundation is, is to wonder, wait, wait, wait do, do I really need this? Um, it, it, it's probable that you actually don't, right? Um, and so, you know, if that's the case, I think now's just like the right time to leave um, the room and go maybe find another session. No, I'm, I'm joking. Of course, you're welcome to stay here. But I think it's really important to um, remember when you're talking about moving a project to a foundation um, that the timing is critical, right? And why am I saying that? Because essentially, you are always better off moving a, found, um, a project to a foundation too late than too early. And so what you essentially want to do is wait until you start experiencing the growing pains um, and be sure that these can be solved by a foundation. So what are good examples of um, issues that can be solved by a foundation? Well, there's a, there are multiple, right? Um, I think the, the, the first one, a very common one, is an operation, operational issues. And um, when um, we decided to move the AMP project to the OpenJS Foundation or to, or to start looking for a foundation that would ho host it, um, these were uh, operational issues were critical to uh, how we were thinking about this. Um, and for example, um, we were having problems covering travel expenses of members of the uh, advisory committee and the technical steering committee. Uh, also, data protection requirements, GDPR, for those uh, that are familiar with it, um, added hurdles to um, uh, organize the community-driven um, contributor summit, right? Um, and another example was, well, the CLA asked um, contributors to assign their license to Google, and this was a deterrent for many M contributors for understandable reasons. Um, uh, another common reason to move is when you have to move to a foundation is when you really start to have trust issues. Someone holds too much power in the project, owns uh, the copyright, owns the trademark, and other players are starting to question the motivation and uh, as a result, uh, uh, not engaging fully or even taking a step back. Um, desiring community uh, openship, uh, ownership, sorry, is also a 
common uh, reason to uh, and a sound reason to decide to move uh, to a project and so is in a multi uh, stakeholder situation creating a level playing field right it's very difficult to get other players involved again if um, uh, there is a clear um, um, competitive advantage of owning the copyright of a project or owning its trademarks so all of those are uh, really good reasons to move a project to a foundation. Um, but you might ask, why would you want to move as late as possible? Well, the thing is, like a foundation isn't free, right? It adds a bunch of overhead. There's a, a lot of things that you could do before really easily that suddenly you have to go through more process to do. And you, there's actual things that you have to do that you didn't before, right? If you have a legal entity, you suddenly start to have to pay taxes or at least like um, you know, uh, get uh, tax reports ready. Secondly, is a, co a foundation costs money, right? It's not, um, depending on what option you choose, and we'll look into this shortly, it can be a lot of money or not a lot of money, but it's still costly, right? And lastly, um, you can actually start on that road to a foundation um, uh, without needing to create a legal entity. For example, if your uh, issues are mainly centered around um, an open governance model, well, you can totally have an open governance model uh, without moving the project to a foundation. And, and that's actually what we started doing uh, for the AMP project, right? So we launched in, in uh, September 2018 an open governance model for the AMP project. Um, was the goal of moving the project to a foundation at a later stage but uh, we already had the governance model out and implemented by the end of that year. Um, moving the project to a foundation took a whole um, other year, essentially. All right, so um, you've actually determined that this, like moving to a um, uh, foundation is actually in fact for you. And now you're like um, uh, trying to figure out in that sea of option, what exactly uh what exactly you should move towards what's the right option for you right and as you'll quickly see there are plenty of options and there are plenty of of uh, different foundations and different solutions um, that are adapted to a widely different set of needs just to give you uh some um, sort of like idea of the of the lay of the land uh, foundations come in all shapes and forms, right? Just um, pulling out the yearly revenue of some of the key um, uh, software um, open source foundations in, in the software space. You'll see, for example, the Apache Software Foundation is a 501c3, so from a, that's a, a, a considered a charity, and nets in two and a half million um, functions on two and a half million dollars of revenue. Whereas the Linux Foundation, for example, uh, has close to a hundred million dollar uh, annual budget and is actually a 501c6, which is more of a, a member consortium type of structure. Um, and, and that's in the US only, right? Uh, most jurisdictions have equivalent legal structures. Um, and so there are a lot of standard bodies, for example, um, that are located in Switzerland. I actually think that uh, Switzerland's jurisdiction um, structures, uh, foundation structures, are um, both lightweight and, and um, super flexible. So they can, they're good to create like a local chess club, but they're also, you can use the same structure to create something like FIFA, right? So really highly flexible solution. Um, and there's a lot of software foundations that are located in different parts of the world. Um, and so when you decide to make that move, you'll see that foundations come, um, as I said, in all shapes and form, but there's sort of like four main category of uh, structures that you can form kind of like main things that you can do. Um, the first is to join an existing foundation. Um, the second is to create a foundation within a foundation. The third is to rely on foundation as a service. So essentially create a foundation, but outsource all of like the operating, um, um, the operations to a, a third party. And lastly, you can essentially roll your own either in the US or elsewhere. 
Um, so the, um, joining an existing foundation um, is a, a, like a really lightweight option. Um, and, you know, an example of that would be just joining the Apache Software Foundation and the F Software Freedom Conservancy, uh, becoming an OSS project to joining the OpenGS Foundation. The benefits are that this is super lightweight. It's cheap, fast to set up. There's little to no maintenance overhead. Uh, if you have a, government, a governance uh, in place, it's essentially going to um, add a bit of... Um, formality around it, but super lightweight. And generally, there are no membership fees um, for joining a foundation like this. Um, it's the, the, the um, uh, operations are covered uh, through sponsorship. So the cons are that this is not really flexible, like either the foundation system, culture, uh, tooling, infrastructure um, is what you want, or it's not. And if it's not, you're out of luck. It's also often a limited solution in terms of what services the foundation offers. Um, very often really focused uh, around IP and there is a lack of independence, right? So essentially you have to follow the rules. A second option here is um, having a foundation within a foundation. So this is uh, something that uh, the Linux Foundation has been driving quite a bit. It's one of the models favored by it. Um, and it essentially creates um, projects of the Linux Foundation, which are called foundations, but from a legal perspective, aren't really uh, a separate legal entity. The benefits is that um, it's actually um, quite customizable. You can really do a custom um, structure for your foundation. Um, and it's also still still cheap and fast to set up because like you don't have to create all the legal hurdle. You know, there's no legal hurdle around it. Uh, on the other hand, some of the key issues as is, well, first of all, it requires members of the foundation to pay membership fees to both the parent and the child um, foundations in, in the structure. So if um, a, a lot of you would be members or already member of the host of the parent foundation, that's fine. But if that's not the case, then it, it, it creates uh, you know, a, a substantial extra fee because um, your members will need to become um, members of both foundations at the same time, right? And then the, the other um, con is that it's um, actually still very dependent from uh, the parent foundation. So you can't just take this foundation elsewhere if you needed to. Uh, so foundation as a service is essentially you build your own foundation and you outsource everything to a provider, right? This is um, um, something that, for example, the OpenJS Foundation is doing. So the OpenJS Foundation is technically, from a legal perspective, a completely separate entity uh, from the Linux Foundation, but it is outsourcing um, all of its operations to the Linux Foundation. The benefits of this is um, your legal structure is completely customizable, right? You're super independent. You can actually even purchase uh, services from different service providers, right? Um, and you, you benefit from the, econo uh, the economies of scale of the service providers. So this is probably less costly for you than it would be to hire um, the same uh, people because you can have, for example, someone that's doing um, uh, PR uh, on a 20%, which would be really difficult for you to get um, otherwise, right? And you're um, free to set up your own membership solution. So you're no longer dependent on whatever solution your um, parent um, foundation has created. Um, and of course, like the cons, uh, you're like really getting into the territory of like rolling your own. And so it's, it's complex to set up. You have to actually create the legal structure. Uh, there's sin significant maint maintenance overhead, etc. And lastly, while well, you can essentially roll your own and hire for your own uh, organization. Um, and so the benefit here is you can essentially build whatever it is that you want that falls um, in, uh, you know, that is legal, right? And uh, in terms of how you can structure it, how membership is organized, et cetera, there's a, a, a huge uh, variety of solutions that you can build and really pick from. And so if, if you want something really, really special, tailored, that's your option.
And of course, the cons are super expensive, complex to set up, no economies of scale, high maintenance too. Um, to uh, high maintenance cost. All right, so we can sort of like place our different options on a, um, a you know, a, a quadrant uh, graph um, uh, where we have on uh, the y-axis essentially uh, costly and complex solutions at the bottom, cheap and easy solutions at the top, um, and on the x-axis moving from rigid on the left to flexible on the right. Um, so the first quadrant, top right quadrant, would be an ideal quadrant. That's our nice uh, house, right size, does exactly what we want it to do, uh, isn't too costly, is quite flexible, fits our purpose great. Um, going to the second quadrant, so a bottom right, you're in very flexible but expensive and complicated. So it's sort of like your own private island. It's great, but you have to uh, fly there with a plane. It's expensive. Uh, you have to have people maintaining it. It's complicated. Um, third quadrant, um, your bottom um, left solution is prohibitively, uh, prohibitively expensive, uh, super rigid, uh, like you bought this castle and you have to now maintain it. It's horrible. You never want to be in this area. And lastly, the fourth quadrant is cheap and easy, but fairly rigid. So you have a tent. Um, a tent is great. It's cheap. But, you know, if it's cold, you can't really go. If it's wet, it, it, it starts getting um, difficult really quickly. Uh, you have to go camp in, in certain areas, etc. So this is kind of like the lay of the land. And if we start, if we position our four options on this, um, we essentially get... Um, joining an existing foundation on the foundation within the foundation bottle um, in sort of like the cheap but fairly rigid area and then in the expensive and complicated but flexible area we have the done for your model and roll your own right and so what we can see here is that there is no perfect solution it's always um, an, an issue of trade-off um, are you going to favor more um, flexibility or you're going to try to be cost effective essentially and where costs are both um, actual um, the, the actual cost that you will put into it in terms of like paying money for it but also in terms of like human resources and how much time you spend um, working on the foundation rather than on your project right and so the question uh, being well which one is a good fit for you well it's going to depend on what your needs are and so in order to have a, a better sense of this, um, like the next step, if you're serious about this, uh, moving your project to a foundation phase, is while well, you actually have to define what your goals and requirements are. Um, and so what's really important here uh, is to have goals that are representatives of the needs of your stakeholders. And those goals also have to be reasonable. Like you can't aim for CNCF-like structure if you're not expecting to have more than 50,000 uh, US dollars as a, a yearly budget, right? Then the next step is going to be to turn those goals into requirements. And those requirements will steer you towards a type of solution, you know, from joining an existing solution to completely rolling your own. Um, and they will also really quickly help reduce the size of your option pool. For example, the Apache Software Foundation was not an option for AMP because of its requirements around tooling. The second thing that you have to really pay attention to when you're in that process is change. Um, we sort of see um, the foundation, the, the Software Foundation space as rigid and fixed in time, and that is actually a pretty big misconception. It's evolving all the time fairly quickly. Uh, because there are new structures that are being created as new languages, projects, verticals gain traction, right? Um, and existing structures change all the time. For example, when we were first looking at um, moving AMP, the uh, Apache Software Foundation couldn't have been an option. We didn't choose it because it was really rigid in terms of software of tooling requirements. And it's now loosening its requirements around this. So maybe for an upcoming project that would have had similar requirements, uh, the ASF could be a good option. 
And then the second thing that you have to be aware of is there are lots of mergers and spin-offs being created all the time. For example, Finos uh, very recently joined the Linux Foundation. Yeah, and so my advice here for you is to look around because um, it might be that you can join forces with something that's happening right now and find like-minded uh, projects or individuals working on uh, trying to solve similar problems right now. And that brings me to, I think, the third key point, which is to seize opportunities. Um, when um, we were looking for an option for AMP, uh, the OpenJS uh, Foundation, which was the merger from the JavaScript Foundation and the Node.js Foundation was announced. And uh, it looked like a great opportunity for AMP. And AMP joining that foundation early in the process um, was able to, um, uh, AMP as a result was able to significantly influence um, the foundation and make it a much better fit for its needs than it would have had if it had joined a, a couple of years later. Um, and so, you know, this kind of gave AMP a perfect option, which was both cheap and easy and rather flexible because AMP was able to seize the opportunity of this foundation being created and help shape it. Lastly, I, I think uh, what you really want to do is, uh, well, sorry, thirdly, I have a, uh, a fourth point, is keep focused, right? Uh, don't get distracted. Some foundations will offer a whole bunch more than what you really need. Um, and if that's not something that you need, don't waste your time um, um, trying to um, find value in this, right? Focus on what you need, your goals and your requirements, not the extra stuff, because it probably won't be very useful to you for a number of years. And lastly, and I think that's really key, is learn from others. A lot of people, a lot of projects have been down that path already. Um, and uh, go talk to them, right? It's the best way to avoid common pitfalls, um, it was extremely helpful on a road uh, to moving AMP um, to the OpenJS Foundations, the OpenJS Foundation, sorry. Um, but what you have to keep in mind is to contextualize the advice that you're getting for your particular uh, situation. Um, because two key reasons. One is the lay of the land has probably changed a lot since um, that advice was valid, as we have seen. Um, and secondly is every project has different needs and hence um, they made different trade-offs, right? You're not going to make the same trade-offs as them. So keep that in mind. Um, and lastly, if um, this is really mission critical, um, and this is a bit of a self-serving uh, um, comment, obviously, but do get uh, professional help for it. Uh, and like all of my clients will tell you, um, having someone do the work and um, uh, walk them through that path um, is something that can be extremely helpful and that will let you focus on the project while you get the setup in the background for you. All right, so um, thank you for your attention. That's all I have for you right now. And we still have a bit of time for Q&A. So, um, I'm, I'm happy to answer those questions. Uh, thank you so much for your time.